Welcome to part two of my video on steam locomotive drafting systems. Here's a few concepts we went over in part one. If you're not familiar with any of these concepts, then you probably should go back and watch part one before moving on to part two. Hi, I'm Eric and welcome to my channel. What's it about? Well, pretty much whatever I want. I've always been a photographer and with this channel I have a new outlet to showcase those images I've collected over the years and are still collecting. My goal? To take things I'm interested in and share them with all of you. You might find yourself going to a place you've never heard of or learning about something you never understood. So stick with me and you never know what's coming up next. <laughs> Now, at the end of the last video, we said that our ultimate goal was to increase draft as much as possible while keeping the back pressure as low as possible. Now, if you consider the principles of fluid dynamics, you're going to see that the key to this is something called the boundary layer, which is where your exhaust stream, the steam in your exhaust, is going to interface with the exhaust gases in your smoke box. Uh, that's carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, oxygen, um, whatever is in your exhaust gases. And it's this interface here that's called the boundary layer. We're going to take a look at this more closely. So over here we've got our exhaust stream and it's moving at some, some velocity, right? Over here we've got air, your exhaust gases, and they basically have, they're stagnant. They, at, initially you have um, no motion. Now, at a molecular level, you've got your molecules of your water molecules in your steam that are going to interact with the molecules of your exhaust gases. And there's going to be friction interaction between those molecules. So your exhaust steam, the energy in your exhaust steam with its velocity is going to transfer energy into the molecules of your air, your exhaust gases. And that's what's really important here because what we want, as the steam moves up the stack, at the boundary layer, it's going to lose some of that energy. It's gonna slow down some of its velocity because it's transferring some of that energy into your, into your air. So with each blast of your exhaust, that steam's going up the strat stack, it's bringing behind it, uh, bringing with it some of your exhaust gases. That leaves an area of negative pressure or vacuum in the smoke box, which then atmospheric pressure is going to want to push air from outside into your smoke box, but its only means of doing that is through the fire bed or through, um, through the dampers in the firebox. So it's gonna push more air, more oxygen into your fire, and then the exhaust bring, push that exhaust gases from the fire through the tubes into the smoke box, which then is gonna get drawn out the stack. And that's gonna happen with each beat of the exhaust. Now, since we see here the key is this boundary layer between your steam and your air, it would we can deduce that our goal is to maximize the boundary layer of our exhaust stream so that we get the most interaction with our exhaust gases. So let's take a look at a couple real life examples. So this is the first nozzle we're gonna take a look at. This is out of former LSNI consolidation number 29, which is a 1906 Alco product. And as far as I know, this is the original, original nozzle that came from the builder. And you see it's basically just a straight conical nozzle with an opening in the top. Now this opening is about 21 and a half square inches and it has a perimeter of 16 and a half inches. So basically you're, if we treat this as a circle your boundary layer is 16 and a half inches. Now somebody added this cross here at some point, I don't know if this is original or that was added later, but you can see the cross was added to probably 
increase turbulence and probably as a way in order to increase that boundary layer. Now, just for reference, 29's piston cylinders have a volume of 12,000 cubic inches. So if you've got 12,000 cubic inches and you try to push them through this opening here of 21 and a half square inches, if you're talking about an incompressible fluid, that's a column of steam. That's a column of steam 48 feet high. Now this nozzle over here is kind of similar. This one came out of another Alco product. This came out of SPNS 539, which is a 282 Mikado that we used to have here. I think it was built in 1917. The, we sold the locomotive. The locomotive is lo no longer here, but the owners were just doing a cosmetic restoration for static display. And so when they took the locomotive, this was already out of it, and it wasn't worth their while in order to bother shipping this back. So I still have it. We still have it in our possession. This is very similar to the nozzle here that you see for 29, same basic concept, with the difference that you've got this shape here, which was probably added in order to reconfigure the smoke box where the exhaust steam came out of the nozzle over here, and then to reposition the steam for the stack, which was some small distance away, and so in order to, to make them line up. But basically, you've got just a round opening, and this one's a little bigger than this one. So 539's nozzle is a little bigger than 29's over here. Larger locomotive, more cylinder volume, at an opening of 30 and a half square inches, and a perimeter of 19 and a half inches. Now somebody added these little tabs on here, similar to the cross over there, for presumably the same function, also to break up the flow and create more turbulence and improve your boundary layer effect. So when 4960 was rebuilt in the 1990s, it was fitted with this nozzle, which I refer to as the star nozzle. And I understand it's from a Pennsylvania railroad design. Now, as you can see, there's much more boundary layer here. So in order to do a proper comparison, I took some measurements, did the calculations, and found that the opening to be about 38 square inches when you add up all of this area here. Now, the uh, the perimeter of this complicated pattern going all the way around is 95 inches. So, whereas 29's area to boundary layer ratio was about 1.3 for this star nozzle, the area to boundary layer ratio is about 0 0.4, which is quite the swing and quite the improvement. And it showed in performance too, whereas with 29, we would typically run a back pressure of about 18 PSI with this star nozzle. We were only running a back pressure of about 12 PSI, which leaves more pressure available for doing work in order to move the locomotive or the train. So this nozzle did work pretty well, but over time it would have a carbon buildup. So as the exhaust steam comes through here, there's steam cylinder oil that we put into the steam in order to lubricate the pistons. Well, that's coming out with the exhaust. And it has a carbon content in it, as, a lot of, as all oils do. And that carbon would build up around these edges. So that would impede the ability for this nozzle to create draft because it would create a barrier to not allow your exhaust gases to come in here as easily. And so we'd have to come around in the morning before we started the day and go down through the stack with a long pole and break off these layers of carbon in order to keep this clean, in order to keep it drafting well. Now, this nozzle is made from a casting. It's one big cast piece. And we have the mold in order to make this, ca this casting as well. We had this one custom cast. Now, since we don't need this nozzle anymore, um, part of the reason I'm making this video today is because this nozzle is getting ready to go to a new home on another locomotive that it's historically um, designed for. So I decided that I would create this informative demonstration while I still have it in my possession. So after the 2004 operating season, both 4960 and 29 
were fitted with a custom-built new nozzle called a Lempor, which is a combination of the name of its designer, Livio Dante Porta, and Belgian engineer, Maurice Lamatrier. And I apologize if I don't have that French name pronounced exactly right. But this nozzle was custom designed by a student of Porta's, Nigel Day from Wales. And it's designed utilizing principles of fluid dynamics, computer modeling, and mathematical equations in order to optimize its performance. And we built this nozzle right here in our own shops. So looking at this nozzle, you can see that it's got four different openings. If you add up the surface area of each one of these openings, you're at 33 square inches, which is considerably more than this straight nozzle over here, but a little less than this star nozzle. Now, the perimeter or boundary layer of all of these is at 41 inches, which is twice as much as that one, but less than half of this one. Now, general convention might think that this is going to be far superior because your boundary layer to surface area ratio is considerably more based upon our calculations than it is here. But there's something here that we can't inherently just assume or understand without more examination. And when you look at these pie shapes here, you don't, we don't really know when the steam comes out of these narrow openings, at what point does the steam basically turbulent, have enough turbulence in order to basically come together and so basically limit your boundary layers. So somewhere in here, there's going to be a point where you're going to, boundary layers are going to basically intersect. So you're not, our 96 or 95 inches of boundary layer are probably not truly accurate for real actual operation. But here, the Lempor takes care of that problem because you've got your four openings which diverge and allow plenty of opening for exhaust gases to come in all the way around on all sides. And then your exhaust streams then reconverge when they go up the stack. Now, it's long been understood that the higher the velocity you have coming out of your openings, the more draft you're going to get. And Dante Porta understood that there was an upper limit to this phenomenon, which is basically the speed of sound. So under maximum load conditions, this is designed so that you get a velocity coming out of these openings just a little bit under the speed of sound. So that high velocity combined with the high effective boundary layer greatly improves the drafting conditions of the locomotive. Now also, because this nozzle drafts so well, your engineer might be able to hook up the locomotive a little bit farther, use a little bit less steam, and, so with, and still get adequate draft. The performance difference between this nozzle and this nozzle, whereas this nozzle we were running at about 12 pounds per square inch of back pressure with good draft. This nozzle produces the same amount of draft, if not better, at only 6 pounds of back pressure under extreme load conditions. It also does a better job of self-cleaning where we don't get the carbon buildup around these openings that we saw on this nozzle. So we don't have the problems with, um, with our drafting throughout the season or through the operating season. And I'm going to show you that here right now. So we're doing the annual inspection on 4960. We're inside the smoke box. There's the Lempor exhaust nozzle right there. Up above it is the stack. Down below it is the Cordina, where it, um, the stand where the comes out of the cylinder saddle. The steam comes out of the cylinder saddle into the Lempor. Over here on the fireman's side, this line coming out of the wall here is the blower line and then attaches to the blower ring. Those little nozzles right there, there's four of them, and those shoot steam up the stack. When you don't have, when the engine's sitting still and you don't have any exhaust, then those blow live steam up the stack in order to create a draft. On the other side, on the engineer side, this line right here, this is an instrumentation line. This is where we measure our back pressure, and there's a gauge in the cab to show the back pressure. Up there in the front is the tube sheet and the superheaters. And so here's the top of the Lempor, and you see this carbon buildup here at the tip. 
we haven't cleaned this out yet, but this is what I was talking about at the uh, that we get carbon buildup. You use from the oils that we use in order to lubricate the cylinders, and then when the oil mixes with the steam and it comes out the exhaust, it will form a layer of carbon out at the edge of the exhaust ports. And this isn't very bad. We got much worse than this when we ran the star nozzle, and we haven't cleaned this lump pour all season. So this is, uh, this is about as bad as the Lempor ever actually gets. Now we're taking a look up the stack. The stack, um, it diverges up there at the top. So it, it spreads out and gets wider the higher up you go. It's basically straight. You got a bell on the bottom and then it's straight for a little while until about the place where it comes out of the top of the smoke box and then it widens out at the top. And that is part of the design of the drafting system. It's quite likely that 29 and 4960 are the only two locomotives in the United States utilizing a lump or exhaust. Nigel Day designed one for a locomotive at the Mount Washington Cog Railway, but I don't think it's still in operation. So, I'll finish with a little history on steam locomotive development and the involvement of Olivio Dante Porta. Steam locomotive development in the United States was pretty much done by the Second World War. EMD had developed a series of successful diesel-electric locomotives, and most of the railroads had realized that diesel-electrics were the ultimate future. The three main locomotive builders continued manufacturing steam locomotives until the end of the war, but only because the War Production Board was controlling the sale of internal combustion engines for the war effort. These were needed in tanks, trucks, airplanes, and boats, not locomotives. With the rise in wartime traffic, the railroads needed more horsepower, and their only option was steam. After 1945, this was no longer the case. Other countries were not as far along in the adoption of diesel electrics as the U.S. Steam locomotives were still produced and widely used in Europe and England well into the 1960s, and engineers were continuing to develop ways to improve their efficiencies. Third world countries were attached to their steam locomotives later still, since they did not have the money or resources to convert their fleets to diesels. We look at steam locomotives today as expensive to maintain and operate, but when labor is cheap and fuel is plentiful locally, not every country has enormous oil reserves. The cost of maintaining aging steam locomotives is more agreeable to purchasing expensive brand new diesel electrics, which need specialized parts, special fuel, and special training to work on. Dante Porta was an engineer from Argentina whose goal was to find ways to make old steam locomotives more efficient by modifying a few key components, as opposed to building brand new from scratch. Although the Lempor exhaust was one of his more significant contributions to the industry, it is by no means the only one. So where did I get my information on the subject? It started by having conversations with Nigel Day when Grand Canyon Railway decided to install the Lempors. But since then, I've found a few good resources to further my understanding on the concept. I'll post a few resources in the description if you want to follow up for yourself. I really hope you found this interesting. I'm planning on following up with a series of technical videos where I'm going to attempt to explain some difficult concepts in more basic terms. So if that is something that suits you, let me know in the comments what you would like to know more about and stay tuned to my channel for the latest installments.